Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19 this morning. We just read the first eight verses of Exodus chapter 19. And last week I began a series uh, called Understanding the Book. And obviously when I say the book, I think everybody knows the book I'm talking about. Okay, we want to have a, a good understanding of the Bible. And as I mentioned last week, if we are going to understand this book, we need to have a solid understanding of, of really the, the plan and purpose of God. Uh, what is God's, you know, big picture plan? What is his plan? And, and uh, you know, as we commented last week, the Bible illustrates this plan in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And of course, God's plan is really threefold. He was going to make of Abraham's seed a, a great nation. That's the first part. He was going to bless that nation. And then, of course, he was going to use that nation as an instrument of blessing to the nations of the earth. And of course, this is a foundational truth as we approach the scriptures. And I, I will say this, and I'll keep saying it until the Lord comes back, but if you lose sight of that truth, you're probably going to lose sight of the Scriptures themselves. And the reality of it is, is people have it mixed up today. They don't understand what God's doing or how this book flows. And uh, what happens is, is they end up misapplying a lot of it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be in that category. But God's plan for Abraham and his seed is basically to be a priesthood to the nations of the earth. And, uh, uh, you know, as we move along, uh, I want to bring you to our text in Exodus chapter 19. You'll notice it says, In the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of of Egypt. So basically, uh, whether it, it says it's in the third month, so maybe not quite three full months have transpired since they left Egypt. It's sometime in the third month. And here they come to uh, the wilderness of Sinai, and they're at the base of the mount there in Sinai. And basically, God begins addressing this nation, and basically it becomes a possible fulfillment of that initial promise God made to Abraham. This is what God's plan and God's uh, desire was to do. In fact, I want you to skip ahead to Acts chapter 7. Head over to Acts chapter 7. And notice what Stephen says as he's standing before uh, the council in Jerusalem. Notice what it says in verse 17 of Acts chapter 7. Stephen says, but when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. The Bible says, when the time of the promise drew nigh. Well, when did the time of the promise drew nigh? According to the end of the verse, it's when the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. As they were multiplying in Egypt, they were coming closer to what God had spoken to Abraham. They were becoming that nation and approaching the time where, guess what? Those promises God made to Abraham, God could then keep those promises. In fact, look what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 2. Head over to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to pick it up in verse 23 of Exodus chapter 2. The Bible says, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And look what it says in verse 24. And God heard their groaning. And then this is important. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. 
And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Now, I want you to get the picture here. Because I think a lot of times we read through the Bible and we don't totally get the, you know, the whole import or the whole force of what's going on here. Uh, God had made some promises to Abraham and those were passed down to Isaac and Jacob. And as I already mentioned, basically it was like threefold. They were going to be a great nation. They were going to be blessed. And then they were in turn going to be a blessing. So what's happening? They're wandering around. And you can read about this in, in Hebrews chapter 11. And on Wednesday nights, we were talking about that, how they were strangers. Even though they were in the land that God had promised, they dwelt there as sojourners. But they're waiting for these promises to be fulfilled. And then all of a sudden, as they spend some time in Egypt, and they're getting weary with all their uh, burdens that have been laid upon him, uh, and being uh, in bondage, God remembers that covenant. And here comes the anticipation. It's the time where God is going to make good on what He told Abraham in Genesis chapter number 12. Those things that He made sure in Genesis 22. Everything that was done in Egypt and on Mount Sinai was on account of those promises made first in Genesis chapter 12. And it's important to follow this through the Scriptures. But as we come to Exodus 19, you come back to Exodus chapter 19, we see that there's this covenant agreed to on Mount Sinai. And we discussed this a little bit last week, but of course the promises made to Abraham really was about uh, you know a blessed nation that's going to be a blessing. And here it gets kind of expanded upon in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says there, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the, all the earth is mine. There's the great nation part. Okay, they were going to become a great nation. They were going to be above all people. Then notice how it goes on in verse 6. It says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. That's the whole uh, be a blessing part. They were going to go out to bless the other nations. And then, of course, it says, and an holy nation. That's the blessed part, how they were going to be blessed by God. But there is a catch here. Because notice that the promises of Abraham, God had put a condition on them. Notice what it says in verse 5. It says, now therefore, if... You, like that word if implies a condition. If, what do they have to do? They have to obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. So basically, God brings the children of Israel down to Egypt and the time comes where he's about to remember his covenant and God says, you know what? I'm going to keep those promises to Abraham but this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to obey my voice and keep my covenant. To be that peculiar, holy, priestly nation, literally all Israel had to do, and I'm going to break this down simply, is just do what they were told. That's all they had to do. And they just had to obey. In fact, notice what follows in verses 7 and 8. It says, Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And what did the people say? And the people answered together, everything that God says, we're going to do. We're going to do it. They agreed to it. They agreed to that. And of course, uh, they uh, agreed to that. And uh, the Bible says all that, all that the Lord had says, we will do. And uh, of course, Moses goes and takes us back to the Lord. It says at the end of the verse, and Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Not like the Lord was in the dark about this. We understand that. He knew their response already. But Moses uh, went and, and told the Lord what the people had said. And 
Now, in case you may be thinking that this isn't exactly fair, because they hadn't really heard what is going to be respond, they're going to be responsible for yet, have they? They just says all that the Lord has said we're going to do. Head over to Exodus twenty four. Exodus twenty four. Notice what it says in verse one. It says, and he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Look at verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. Now, what are the words of the Lord and what are uh, all the judgments? Well, that's the things that Moses had just received from the Lord beginning in Exodus 20. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20, I'm sure people have probably heard uh, of this before. Uh, but it, it starts in verse 1. It says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which thou, uh, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What's that commonly referred to as, that list? The Ten Commandments. But not only that, he continues on later on, and he starts going through other judgments. In verse 21, it says, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. So Moses is given this list from Exodus chapter 20 to Exodus chapter 23 of these laws and these judgments that the children of Israel are to obey. This is the covenant that God is making with this nation. And look what happens in verse 3. So when Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, the Bible says, and all the people answered with one voice and said, that's what they said, all the words which the Lord has said will we do. They were like, sign me up. Let's do it. Let's go forward. We want to do this thing. We're going to keep all those things. We're going to obey all those things. Now let's go back and read Exodus 20 again. What was that? I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. Isn't it interesting? That's like the very first thing that God says is thou shalt have no other gods before me. You're not supposed to make any graven image. You're not supposed to bow down to those graven images. And all the people are like, you know what, God? We're going to do everything that you said. Every single thing that you just said to Moses, we are going to do. And right here you're thinking, wow. God's promises are going to come to fruition. This nation is going to be blessed, and they're going to, again, become that kingdom of priests that God wants, and they'll be able to go and and reach the other nations of the earth, being that priesthood and, and everything. You're thinking, this is great. Well, what was the problem? I want you to head over to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter number 7. Again, Stephen highlights this in his history lesson. Acts chapter 7, look at verse 39. Well, let's pick it up in verse 37, just so we get the context. It says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Look at verse 39, to whom our fathers, and notice what it says there, would not obey. 
but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turn back again unto Egypt. And then look at verse 40. It shows the instance where they disobey. Saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. So when did they obey, disobey? When they made that golden calf. In fact, that's when Moses was up in the mount. Moses was up in the mount talking with God. And while Moses is up in the mount and they're waiting for him to come back, they go to Aaron and say, hey, make us a golden calf. And you can read about this in Exodus 32. But you need to understand that this is when that whole priesthood thing was taken off the table. Because it was conditioned on their obedience. And they disobeyed, disobeyed almost immediately. In fact, the reality of it is, is that disobedience has kind of been the storyline throughout the entire Old Testament. It seemed like as time went on, the seed of Abraham just simply refused to obey. In Numbers chapter 14, head over to Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 13, Moses had sent some spies into the land of Canaan to search out the land. And I think we all know what took place. There was 12 spies and Caleb and Joshua came back with a good report saying, let's go now. Let's go take this land. But 10 of them brought back an evil report saying, we can't do it. We're not strong enough. The people are big, the walls are tall, the cities are fortified, you name it. And of course, that moved the people to say, hey, we can't go up. They refused to go in and take the land. And of course, we know because of that, God said for every day that those spies were in the land, the 40 days, the children of Israel is going to wander a year for each one of those days in the wilderness. 40 years. Basically, until he said that faithless generation died off. But we'll pick it up in, in, in Numbers chapter 14. Verse 20, it says, And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory... And my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these, notice that, ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Isn't that interesting? In Numbers chapter 14, they had tempted him ten times. Now, I'm sure if you went through and studied it, you could probably identify those ten times. But do you realize that up to Numbers chapter 13, just a little over a year had taken place since they had left Egypt. In fact, look back at Numbers chapter 9. You can see that in Numbers chapter 9, verse number 1. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt. So that's just over a year that had transpired. And it, remember, it was the third month that they went up and received the covenant. So we're probably looking at maybe under a year from the time when they first said, All that the Lord has said we will do. So in that span of, say, let's say 10 months, they tempted the Lord 10 times. Even a little over a year. 10 times. Listen, this is the sum total of what took place throughout the entire Old Testament. In fact, the prophets commented on it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 11. 
Jeremiah chapter number 11. Look what Jeremiah writes. Jeremiah 11, beginning in verse 7, the Bible says, For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. So up until the time of Jeremiah, which is right around the captivity, what was God doing? He was protesting right from the very time they left Egypt. Yet, look at verse 8, they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. That's really the sum of the Old Testament. That's the summary. In fact, look what Isaiah says in Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24. In verse 4, it says, The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Look at Hebrews chapter 8 with me. Head over to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 8. Look what the book of Hebrews says in verse number 9. It says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because why? They continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Listen, God had great plans for the seed of Abraham. This nation that was born in Egypt. But you know what? Those plans were never realized. God had made some promises to Abraham. We saw them in Genesis chapter 12. As we come to the book of Exodus, what's happening? God's getting ready. There's this anticipation where He's going to fulfill those promises He's going to make that nation great. He's going to bless them. And then they're going to be able to become that blessing that God desires them to do. And what do they do? They get up into the mount. They hear the words of God. They hear what the covenant is. They hear what they have to keep. And they say, you know what? We're going to do everything. All that God had said we're going to do. And then before anyone can sneeze. Moses is up in the mount, and the very first thing that God had told them, the thing that's probably at the top of God's greatest concern, they're making a molten image, and they're worshiping a golden calf. Right out of the gate, they broke the covenant. And folks, there was nothing wrong with that covenant. The people actually agreed to it. The problem was not with the covenant. The problem was with the people. They agreed to obey the voice of the Lord and keep his covenant. But they did not follow through. And because they disobeyed, you know, the law, that opportunity to be the kingdom of priests was temporarily removed. In fact, look at Deuteronomy 28. Head over to Deuteronomy 28. 
This is over 40 years later. Israel's on the brink of getting ready to go in and claim their land. Look what God says in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, or the Bible says. It says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. And of course, God goes in and starts listing how they could have physical blessings. But also there's curses associated. But not once does he say there, hey, if you obey my voice, you keep my commandments, I'm going to make you that kingdom of priests. You don't see that anymore. Because that was taken off the table when they went up and they started making that golden calf. That, of course, as you read through the Bible, what God made a promise to Abraham. God brought the people to Egypt, pulled them out of Egypt so he could fulfill that promise. And because of the failure of the people, that promise was again basically put on hold. So as we read through the Old Testament, understanding God had a purpose for Abraham and his seed, we saw that they were given an opportunity for that plan and purpose to come to fruition, obviously through the covenant of the law. But because the people disobeyed, they didn't keep the covenant that God had made with them. Those promises that God made to Abraham were never realized. And because of that failure, the failure of the people to keep that covenant, keep the law, God called an audible. I want you to head over to Jeremiah 31 with me. Jeremiah 31. what the Bible says in verse 31. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make, what does he say? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, And the day they took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they what? They broke. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Look at verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So what happened was, is God made some promises to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. As they go into Egypt, God's about to take them out of Egypt, and he's about to fulfill those promises. But the children of Israel couldn't keep the covenant. So what happens? There's a pattern of disobedience all throughout the Old Testament, and then we get this glimmer of hope in Jeremiah, where God promises a new covenant. Not like the one from Sinai. There's going to be a different one. The one where the law is actually going to be in the heart. It's going to be written in the heart, as the Bible says. In their inward parts, the Bible says, and write 
in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people, according to verse 33. So we see this promise of a new covenant offered. It was one that was different from the one on Mount Sinai, a covenant that would replace the one that was given on Mount Sinai. One that they were to keep that covenant, they could again inherit those promises that God gave to Abraham. You know, the ones about them being a great nation, being blessed, and being a blessing to all the nations of the earth. You know, Hebrews chapter 8, if you head over to Hebrews chapter 8, kind of describes things for us. Again, I want to emphasize this. There was nothing wrong with that first covenant that God had established. The problem was with the people. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. That's the new one that we mentioned in Jeremiah 31. For finding fault with them. That's where the fault was. The fault was with the people. Because the people that, 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 you know, trumpeted all that the Lord has said, what we do, didn't do it. They broke that covenant. He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one was going to be a better one. One that they were going to keep. But listen, the problem wasn't with God's design. The problem was with the sinful heart of man. You know, Paul described it best in Romans 8.3 when he says the law was weak through the flesh. There's nothing wrong with the law. There was nothing wrong with those commandments. The problem was with the flesh of, of sinful man. They had a problem keeping those, te- those things, but... Listen, as we go through the Old Testament, as the time of the Old Testament closes, the nation of Israel, this nation, the seed of Abraham that God had promised so many things, had been experiencing those curses that God mentioned in Deuteronomy 28. Because they had turned away from the Lord. I mean, you kind of saw uh, pictures of it through Judges, but as you it come to the uh, the end of uh, uh, you know whether it's Second uh, Kings or Second Chronicles, you understand that idolatry had kind of become a staple, whether it was in Israel or in Judah, and that's when God finally sent Assyria to the northern kingdoms and Babylon to the south. The children of Israel were taken into captivity. By the way, that's where they were when Jeremiah was given that promise of a new covenant. Listen, they're under the law, but there is that hope of a new covenant. Something new. And and, and I can't emphasize this enough. You need to remember that there's more than just land involved. I think some people, you know, today get so caught up with you know, that piece of land over there in the Middle East, that that's all they think is promised to Israel. God has a greater plan and purpose for them just to dwell in the land. Today, many people get so focused on the land part and what, you know, God promised in that respect, they forget the very divine purpose God has in store for the seed of Abraham. The heavenly calling that we've read about in, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. But listen, as you come to this book, you need to consider what God promised to Abraham and understand that, you know, the reality of it is, as I mentioned last week, the first time something began to be written down was in Exodus 24. That's when the people agreed to do what God had said they were going to do. That covenant was ratified. They heard what God had to say. They said, hey, we're going to do it. Uh, and, 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 you know, then, of course, everything was, uh, you know, the, 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 th- the, the animals were slaughtered, blood was shed, and uh, things were, uh, were ratified. And <laughs> I 
That's really the story that's going on throughout this book. God has a plan for the seed of Abraham. He has a plan for the nations. But when we read this book, you understand that this Old Testament, what's going on, it's pushing towards fulfilling the promises that God made to Abraham. God made an attempt at Sinai, and the people failed. They whiffed. So as you go through the Bible, guess what? You're going to see another attempt. And Lord willing, we're going to look at that next week. But really, if you can get a hold of these truths and you understand that, and you understand that in the context of the Scriptures, you're going to be well on your way to having a solid understanding of what this book is about. Let's pray together this morning. Father, uh, Lord, I pray that you would just challenge us, speak to us, encourage us. Lord, as we consider this great plan that was first put in motion so many years ago with Abraham, this promise that was made, or as we consider how uh, you were ready to fulfill those promises, you brought Israel to a place where they could become that kingdom of priests, where they could fulfill, be, be that great nation. You could bless them and they could be a blessing to all the families of the earth, Father. We see that in Exodus 19 through 24. Lord, through their failure, we see how they're left looking, hoping, wanting a new covenant so that they could obtain those promises they could fulfill those promises that were given to them. Father, I pray that these truths would not escape us, they would not be hidden from us, but that we would understand what your purpose, your plan is. Lord, help us as we study your word, as we read your book. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.